and we'll start uh, you know the, the webinar part of this. Um, if you have uh, questions again, um, just chat them and, and we'll go from there. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and get started here. Um, so tonight, so this is this is a, a webinar series uh, that I'd like to do for the biomechanics of hitting, and it's much like what we did. We just recently did in the fall for golf, uh, sort of the, the golf movement uh, 101. Um, but this is going to be a little bit lighter, and it's going to cover the basics. And I'm going to get going, and then I, up from here, I'm going to, to 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 have a similar series on pitching or throwing in general, and then a similar series on um, acceleration, change of direction, and speed. Uh, and then we'll have these kind of overview uh, seminar series or webinar series. And then from there, we can get into more detail. We can get into more, more um, both from an analysis perspective detail and also from an application, which I think is really the most important part of this is the practical application of the information. And we can get into much more detail uh, as we move forward. But this is meant as not a, a watered down version, but certainly as an overview version. It's kind of a starting point for everybody. Some, some of the people involved in the webinar certainly will have had uh, quite a bit of experience with this technology and the parameters and some of the stuff we're going to talk about. And for some people, it's going to be brand new. So we're going to kind of, kind of keep it at a level where everyone can benefit, but we, we set a foundation for moving forward. So tonight, what we're really talking about um, is the overview of uh, this, what, we, what we do as far as 3D data uh, and swing evalu evaluation process. So, what I would like to try to do this evening is to blend um, both the information, at, you know, as far as swing dynamics and, and, and uh, the biomechanics of it, as well as a little bit of overview as to what we do as a company with Xenolink, so you have a basic idea of, of kind of how we approach this, and they'll kind of they'll sort of dovetail together, uh, I think, pretty nicely. So tonight we're going to talk about essentially the overview uh, or sort of the sort of the basics of evaluating the swing mechanism or, or swing performance from an activity-specific functional perspective. Oops. Um, so uh, what we're going to do, whoops, um, what we're going to do is we're going to cover uh, essentially this, um, uh, this, this evaluation process from a layered perspective. So what we've started to do uh, with respect to uh, the Xenolink process itself is we have uh, started to create a sort of a leveled or layered approach to evaluating data. So we start with uh, a, a sort of a base level of data and information and then we move to a more advanced or more involved level of data and information and from there we can draw um, uh, uh, conclusions as to where somebody stands kind of overall in this process and then the, the finer points of where they're breakdown mechanisms are and what we want to try to do as far as um, the, the training part of all this. Alright, so the first layer of this is the, we're going to focus on three primary um, parameters, power, coordination, and performance. So just a little bit of background here. So what we have found in doing all sports really, but, but very specifically obviously baseball, um, is that to start it's important to have a, a foundational understanding of where a player stands as far as their hitting mechanism or their hitting uh, biomechanics. The sort of the primary drivers that facilitate their ability to, to, to perform as a hitter at the plate. When you get right into the hardcore, you know, kind of quote unquote biomechanics, um, there's a lot of information there. You can get overwhelmed by the information, and it is certainly uh, much harder to um, uh, to sort of uh, uh, quantify and, and to some degree evaluate a player's level relative to their peers when you look at a large volume of data or when you look at um, very complex parameters. So our first layer that we've, we've been developing over the last year or so is really a very simple look, but yet a very powerful look at a few key parameters that are simplistic in, in sort of nature, but comprehensive in terms of their their relationship to uh, performance. And so we have three primary numbers that I'm going to explain to you here. 
One identifying what we'll, we'll say just as an overview is power. One uh, as an overview of coordination, and then the last sort of the sort of the catch-all as overall performance. All right. So as far as power goes, power. If you look at if you're trying to evaluate a hitter, it, it's say in a combine style, and I'll explain how this stuff has kind of come together here in a second. But if you're trying to evaluate a hitter, it's sort of in a combine style type of, of way, um, many times uh, what ends up happening is power. Let's say um, as a as a sort of uh, individual characteristic is is. Uh, evaluated as a function of maybe say a vertical jump or some other type of sort of analogous measurement, which gives you some idea of their ability to generally recruit for the most part, but really doesn't have a very direct relationship to their ability to create speed or power from a rotational perspective, swing, you know, distal and acceleration type perspective. Um, and, and so something like, you know, just use a vertical jump or maybe a 40 or 60 time or some kind of more traditional measure of power or speed doesn't necessarily correlate to, to bat speed. So what we're talking about here in terms of power is a measurement of the maximum speed that's created as a function of their bat speed. So I'll just read this to you and then I'll explain a little bit. What, what our, our version of power potential is, or power, is the maximum speed um, of the bat. It's an indicator of the hitter's current ability to create power through fiber recruitment and force production. Uh, the speed at the very end or the head of the bat is tracked two dimensionally and the maximum speed is attained uh, uh, by a hitter um, or the maximum speed that's attained by a hitter is captured and recorded. So really what we're looking at here is we track from a three-dimensional six degree of freedom three-dimensional perspective we track the very end of the bat and, and uh, uh, we measure its speed, and essentially miles per hour, as it moves through the entirety of the swing. We pick off the maximum speed, wherever that occurs, as an indication of what a hitter is potentially uh, capable of in terms of just pure power. Okay? So that's really, what that really kind of essentially boils down to is muscular recruitment. Okay? Your ability to actually... Um, uh, uh, recruit and produce force at the muscular level and then that force being related to power and, and, and speed. Right? So we're able to measure that as more a function of activity specific movement as opposed to general power, like I, like I said, a, a, a vertical jump or some other measurement that's maybe in the past more traditionally used. So what this does is this gives us an ability to look at an athlete's ability to create muscular force and, and produce force in such a way that, that it results in uh, bat speed, okay? And we'll, we'll refer to this as power. All right, now the uh, second characteristic that we talked about is essentially coordination. So I'll just read this and then we'll explain it. Percent utilization is a measure of how effective a hitter is at timing maximum bat speed and contact. It's a very important indicator of timing and biomechanical coordination or swing efficiency overall. Speed at the end of the bat is tracked to eventually during the swing. We just talked about that. Maximum speed is, is collected, and we just talked about that as a function of power. Speed at impact uh, with the ball is also captured. And then what we look at is the percent of maximum speed uh, that is actually utilized at contact. So we do a, a comparison, and that gives us a number that's essentially uh, an indicator of percent efficiency, if you will, and that is directly related to swing coordination. So you're going to have an athlete's ability to produce power, okay, and then you're going to have an athlete's ability to coordinate that effort uh, so that power or bat speed is being timed as effectively as possible with contact with the ball, with collision. So that gives us an indication of how well an athlete is coordinating the effort um, in addition to how well somebody is creating the speed in the first place. So these are two singular numbers. They're very simple to understand. Um, you know, your, your high-level guy can understand them and, and your, your athlete can understand them. Your, your, your athlete's parents can understand them. So, uh, if you, you know, if you're working with juniors. So these are very simple numbers, but in these, in these numbers, if you understand where they come from and their relationship to the biomechanics, and that's what we're going to get into a little bit deeper here as, uh, soon, um, if you understand all this, these numbers, although they're simple, are extremely powerful. 
They're extremely powerful as the starting point of evaluating a, a, a hitter's performance ability, um, but they're also a very easy way to compare your hitter to populations. So that you have a better uh, and, a, and a very quick understanding of where a hitter lies with respect to their peers, with respect to um, uh, uh, different levels of peers. You know, you can look at certain populations. If you're looking at your youth population, maybe you're 14 or you're 16 under. If you're looking at um, your 14 U comparatively to say where they want to be, college or where they want to be, major league baseball you can start to see also where they lie and where their weaknesses are very quickly with a few numbers and a simple comparison. So that's why we start with this basic level. Now let's go to the last parameter that we mentioned, and that's performance. We, we've called it xenofactor. But basically what this is, and I'll just read it and then I'll explain it. Xenofactor is a combination of power potential and swing coordination. So really what we're looking at now in one simple number is your ability to recruit and create power, or speed, bat speed and your ability to time that bat speed or coordinate that bat speed with impact. So when you look at those two variables, you're now looking at a hitter's ability to perform, essentially. Um, and and as, it, as this reads on, it says this is the best indicator for overall hitting performance. And, and it's a simple number in that it's the maximum speed value, whatever that is in miles per hour, essentially combined with the percent efficiency value, and that creates a, an overall number um, that allows us to sync power, coordination, efficiency, timing, and contact, and generally overall performance. So you've got, at that first layer of information, you've got recruitment or raw power, but raw power specific to an activity, which is very different from what's typically measured in, in these combine type scenarios or in these you know, hitter evaluation scenarios. You then have coordination, which is typically not measured at all in these, in these uh, uh, combine or, or evaluation um, uh, processes. So now we have raw recruitment specific to the activity at hand, and we have coordination, which is now very related to things like kinetic linking and, and stability and lower body mechanics and all these types of more biomechanics-based parameters. And then we have a number that essentially looks at both raw ability as well as coordination or, or um, uh, sort of uh, activity specific fu activity specific function and it combines them to look at overall performance right? so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to break from the lecture part uh, and we're going to move over to uh, how this plays out in terms of data okay now let me just quick look if you know again if you have um, if you have any questions uh, just chat them as we move along so here what I've produced here, is, is a spreadsheet uh, of a player. We're going to kind of essentially look at this as, as a one-player case study tonight. So player one is our, our case study data. What I have here is uh, numbers that are uh, have been produced off of uh, a high level. So we have a player who's essentially in the 14U type uh, uh, age bracket. We now have numbers that have been created off of high level 14U showcase events, okay? And so this means this is these are, are high-level athletes that are that are uh, lucky enough to get to go to a high-level showcase, um, you know, where scouts are present, there's recruiting going on and all that kind of stuff, and we're able to actually collect the data. Now, before we get into the data, just to, to back up a little bit and give you a little bit of an idea of, of how we do this and, and from a Xenoid perspective, what we're doing. We have... Um, essentially uh, the ability to collect data using video um, and then produce from that video produce uh, uh, six degree of freedom 3D uh, uh, representations of an athlete's movement and then from that 3D representation create uh, biomechanical evaluations and we can do it at this layer one and then we're going to talk about layer two which is much more advanced but we're able to do that uh, without markers, without sensors, without hardware uh, placed on the body or placed on the individual. So we can go to showcases uh, or large events and test large numbers of, of hitters or, or athletes in general, whatever the activity, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an afternoon or a given time frame and produce large volumes of data. You can also obviously do this on a one-on-one -on -one basis and certainly on a team basis and at all the different levels. but the ability to uh, uh, capture this data um, out sort of in the field at a large, uh, 
you know, at, at a large level in terms of volume and, and activity provides a unique ability. So just as an example, we have uh, the ability to capture here numbers from a, uh, a fairly significant um, uh, sort of showcase event with fairly large numbers. numbers. This is a small population of a 14U group, um, but it gives you some idea of comparison. Now, player one is the athlete that we're going to be sort of looking at here. Player one obviously did not attend this, this, um, this showcase and it isn't part of, of, of his data group, but we can compare and get an idea of where that player stands in overall performance, both from a raw recruitment perspective as well as a coordination perspective, and then certainly an overall performance perspective. So we can look at this player relative to these normals or relative to this data, and we can also do some, some primary evaluation that sets us up for looking deeper into the issues that the athlete has and then creating a program. So, you know, what we want to do moving forward tonight in an overview fashion, but as we move forward in the next three weeks and we look at lower body and we look at torso, core, and we look at upper extremity and back, we want to not only provide in-depth information about what those characteristics are, what those parameters are, you know, how we evaluate, what that all means, but we want to get very specific ideas as to how you can create training programs that have significant impact on the movement that drives these areas. We can say, essentially call them primary drivers, your lower body mechanics, your core mechanics, your extremity mechanics relative, especially relative to bat dynamics. So let's take a look. What we've done here is we've taken this population of high level of 14 year athletes and we have created the numbers we just talked about. Max speed is going to be your power. PU is going to be your percent utilization or your coordination number. And the ZF is your Zeno factor. And what we've done for this population of 60 or so athletes is we have uh, ranked them in the three categories. So you have the ability to rank athletes um, in large populations and then compare individual athletes to the normals to give an idea of, of essentially where an athlete stands. So what I did was I marked the high level uh, performers in maximum speed, percent utilization, and Zeno factor with, uh, with these letter um, designations. So you've got your maximum speed is your XX designation, and your uh, athlete that had the, the, the highest percent utilization was YY, and then overall performance ZZ. So let's just take a quick look at this, and then we'll look at our player one. So what we're looking at here is, is right away we see our, our maximum speed for 14U designated as XX uh, hit 89 miles per hour, almost 90 miles per hour, which is extremely high bat speed for this age level. So you see that, that XX has the ability to recruit muscular force, produce muscular force, to then coordinate or utilize, and I shouldn't say coordinate, that's misleading, but to utilize that force production to create speed in a raw format. So raw recruitment, very high. 90 miles an hour is extremely fast for 14U, and that shows that you have a very high level of recruitment ability or power ability. Okay? When you look at percent utilization, which now uh, relates more to your uh, coordination effort, your kinetic linking and those kinds of things, you'll see that XX is way down here. I mean, about halfway through this population, maybe even a, a little bit further than halfway down the population. So what this tells you is that XX as an athlete uh, has a lot of raw power ability, but doesn't coordinate very well. Okay, so that gives you an idea of where that athlete stands right away. And then if you look at their overall ability, you'll see because of this massive amount of speed overall, they rank fairly high. They're in the top 10 of this, uh, of this uh, population based predominantly on their ability to create power. So what this tells you is, is when you're looking at this athlete, XX, that this athlete has incredible opportunity, incredible ability in terms of raw power. But you definitely need to work on coordination with this athlete because they're not tapping into to near what, I mean, if you look at your highest level of percent utilization, you're almost at 100% utilization, which, which indicates a very coordinated effort. When you're looking at XX, you're looking at 90. So we're, we're, we've lost 10% of our total output um, at the impact zone. So we've lost a considerable amount of that raw ability. So as an athlete, you know, okay, guys, 
in the ballpark here as far as our top 10 of this population, but we're way off the, the mark in terms of coordination. Now, if you look at this next level, maximum speed, or I'm sorry, uh, percent utilization, YY is 99% utilization, which means that 99% of their raw ability is being delivered to collision, which is extremely efficient and extremely coordinated. However, if we look back here, you'll see that YY's max output is only 77 miles per hour. So again, a little bit more than halfway through the population, but still way off the mark in terms of power output when you're looking at almost 90 here at your top level. So again, YY tells us, and again, YY is going to be in your top 10, but YY has great coordination and, and functional capacity, but is definitely not recruiting very well. So that tells you right away where this athlete is lacking in overall performance. Now let's go to our best scenario. Let's go to our ZZ. Our ZZ has an overall zeal factor of what we'll say 184, okay? Um, and that is just a combination of speed and performance. But you'll see they're in the top five in both. So we have 87 miles per hour of maximum speed, only two miles per hour off of the top. You've got 97, really round up 98% utilization, which is only 1% off of the top. So you've got a really good ability to create raw power, and you've got a really good ability to coordinate that effort um, in terms of you know, kinetic working, coordination, overall uh, uh, functional output. So that tells you, again, um, that you've got uh, uh, now sort of the complete package. So, Z, uh, so uh, ZZ ranks the highest in terms of overall performance because you not only have raw ability, raw power, speed, uh, creation ability, but you have someone who's coordinating that effort extremely efficiently. So you've got the best of all worlds, and since they rank number one in your overall population, or your overall uh, performance um, uh, parameter for this population. Okay, so now let's, so you got a, a little bit of a lay of the land here. Um, let's take a quick look at, um, at uh, our player uh, one. So now we have a player one who, who uh, if you look at, say, for example, uh, maximum speed output is at about 70, 67. You're round, you can just round up to 70 just as a round comparison. But you're about eight, eight and a half miles per hour off of the average. So you're in the ballpark. You can see that the normal range for this high level population has a standard deviation of about six miles per hour. So you're talking about 69 to, to um, uh, 81 uh, miles per hour as kind of your rate, kind of your normal range. This player is right off the normal range on the low end, um, so about you know a little bit more than than the range. Uh, so you know right away that average, uh, you know, power output is reasonable. But but obviously, if you look over here, and what I did was I brought over the high. So the high, when you're talking about who, you know, what was the highest bat speed, you're talking 22 miles per hour off of the high. So right away, you know that this person, this this player, is in the ballpark in terms of recruitment, but still has a ways to go relative to your high level, you know, your highest outputs in that, and certainly is at the, the bottom end of the normal range. So you know that the person's in, in the ballpark, right, but you know that power is certainly an issue, right? When you look at your uh, percent utilization or more of your coordination numbers, again, you'll see that they're about three, almost four percent off of the average or the mean. And, and you can see relative to, to uh, the, the maximum level, the highest level performance, they're about 12% off, which is fairly significant. So what you again have is someone who is in the, in, in the range of that elite population's normals, uh, a little bit on the low side, but certainly in the range, but definitely lacking in the, the higher ranges, right? So you know where you want to work. And if you had to look between the two of them, you'd say there's a little bit more skewed towards uh, coordination than it is recruitment, although recruitment is certainly a part of the equation. So if you had to bias what, what we see here in terms of output, we'd say we have both um, a recruitment issue as well as, or a power issue as well as a coordination issue, but we would skew it a little bit more towards the bias of, of um, coordination. And then when you look at the overall outcome, 154 as a combination of the two, again, is basically on the low side of normal range, 
but you know, not that far off our, our mid-range, so we know we're in the ballpark. We're not that far off from this elite population. But certainly when you look at the highest level overall performance, now you're talking about 30 points. So now you know relative to sort of the, the best of that, that population, we definitely have some work to do. So in terms of overall performance, we know that we've got work to do, um, and it's going to be both a combination of power and recruit, or I'm sorry, power and coordination with a skew towards coordination. So right away, we're just looking at three very simple numbers. We already know a lot about this athlete. We know where this athlete, um, from a hitting perspective, um, lies relative to elite population of, of the peers. But we also have a pretty good idea of where we want to be or where we want to start looking in terms of a more in-depth analysis, as well as how we want to start to structure our training to be a little bit more individualized. So what we want to do is, you know, uh, it's always good to have essentially a systematic approach to training, both from a technique coaching perspective as well as a strength and conditioning perspective. But inside the umbrella of that system or that approach, we want to be able to fine-tune both our, um, uh, our uh, strength and conditioning efforts as well as our coaching efforts to, to match the individual's needs so we get better results faster from our athlete. And in between the strength and conditioning and the coaching efforts, what we want to have is some movement training. And that's what we're going to get into in the weeks to come is, is really hit that movement training aspect. We're not going to get into that stuff tonight. And tonight's mostly about evaluating and sort of identifying the issues as we start to see them. Um, so we're not going to get into the specifics of training today, but we will get into the overview of general approach and how we want to start to tweak that. So just again, as a quick recap, we basically have an athlete that is in the ballpark as far as the elite level peers or the elite level population, but on the low side of the normal ranges. And we have both power or recruitment issues as well as coordination or functional issues, but we are definitely skewed towards the coordination and functional issues. Those are more glaring than the recruitment issues. And that gives us a basic idea of where, of where this athlete is, very simply in three numbers. And the cool thing about the Xenolink process as a, as a function of this is those three numbers can be attained very easily and very quickly as a function of, of um, a non-evasive, you don't have to put anything on the bat, you don't have to put anything on the athlete, um, you basically uh, just do some high-speed filming with a calibration process, and that can be done for one person, that can be done for a team, or that can be done for 300 people in an afternoon. So it's nice that you can create these numbers very easily and very simply and very quickly to get a very basic but very important lay of the land in terms of uh, where an athlete stands. Okay? So let's go ahead back to our um, uh, slide presentation here and let's go into the second layer of where we want to go. So now we know an athlete has um, where an athlete stands and an athlete has some recruitment issues in terms of raw power, and an athlete has some coordination issues in terms of functional movement. So when we look into the second layer, we want to start looking at um, uh, a more in-depth evaluation of those components. So we're going to look at things like kinetic link. Kinetic link, and, we'll, and I'm going to explain this stuff a little bit today, but I'm really going to get into it in the weeks to come where we talk specifically about some, some uh, very specific areas. And that second layer is going to, we're going to talk about kinetic link, which is your, 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 your sequencing of, of, of body segment uh, speeds and creating power. So it's essentially your power generation process. So we're going to talk about how that's, that's being performed. That's probably our number one second layer point of evaluation. We then look at uh, lower body mechanics stride length, stride position, and the relative impact on, uh, of stride on, say for example, lower body mechanics and lower body speed. We then look at core and torso mechanics. Here we're really looking at the differential mechanism, the ability to translate lower body force and, and, and uh, speed production into uh, uh, rotational speed at the core and then delivering that rotational speed to upper body and then ultimately to, to the back. So we're going to take a look at kinetic link, the lower body mechanics, which sort of essentially drive the power process, the core mechanics, which are essentially uh, sort of differentiating or turning the power and the speed, and then upper body and back dynamics, which is essentially the delivery of that speed to collision. 
So when we go ahead and, and, and look at our, our, uh, our second layer, we're going to look deeper into the biomechanics. Give me one second here, and we're going to look at sort of this next level of biomechanical data. So going into account here, we're going to pull up our sample data. All right. So the first thing that we're going to look at here is, is the kinetic link itself. So uh, just as a brief part of explanation here, um, I'm going to just kind of get, go an overview because as we move forward, we're going to do, do, do more specific and very in-depth sort of analysis of these different areas of the kinetic link and whatnot. But generally speaking, what we're talking about is the rotational speed output of very specific body segments. So we're talking about what we, we call low, or hip segments. We're essentially talking about the pelvis uh, and the lower body. So we're looking, if we look at this, at the hitter anatomically, I'm going to draw the stick figure here. What, you, what you're essentially looking at is uh, the pelvis as, as, a, as a body segment. We'll call that just hip segment. And then we're looking at shoulder segment, which is really essentially this upper thoracic. So you imagine the upper part of the torso, including you know, the, the, the thora upper sort of thoracic spine, the rib cage, and the shoulders, and all that mechanism of the, of the upper torso. When we talk about arms, we're essentially talking about both arms, complex, shoulders, elbows, forearms, wrists. But essentially, what we're looking at as a function of that complexity is the ability to move the, uh, the arms as a unit around the spine, essentially from the top of the spine or from the spine as an axis to, the, to where the, the, the athlete is gripping the bat. So that's what we refer to as arm segment. And then the bat itself is going to be uh, the, the last sort of component of this chain of events. When we look at the kinetic link, what we're looking at here is the ability to coordinate the effort of using the ground effectively to create force and again, we're going to talk more specifically about lower body mechanics next week. But essentially, as an overview, we are using the ground to create force. And that force, or that ground reaction to force, is then utilized to produce movement. That movement is essentially going to be focused at, at the pelvis and the rotation of the pelvis essentially around the bottom of the spine. All right? It also relates to the translation of the body backward and forward, essentially towards the mound or away from the mound. Um, and, and, but ultimately, it boils down to the ability to use all those components to create rotation around the, the bottom of the spine. That uh, rotation of the bottom of, uh, of the spine or the pelvis is then going to connect with the upper torso, which then also uh, uh, creates a rotational movement relative to this axis that the torso or the spine essentially is creating and you get rotational movement there, and then you get rotational of the movement of the arms around essentially that axis, and then you get the rotational movement of the, the bat itself away from the arms or away from the body, and then we call that bat release. So what we're looking for is a very specific sequence. Now, when this sequence is um, ultimately timed effectively, you get the lower body or the pelvis or the hip segment driving the shoulder or, or the upper thoracic segment, which then drives the arms, which then drives the bat. And then that bat uh, speed, that, that release and that angular linear component should be occurring very, very close to the impact zone. The um, uh, athletes that do this effectively uh, are, are your athletes that uh, are, have high coordination numbers. And those uh, high coordination numbers result in a high percent utilization. That high percent utilization um, really boils down to the ability to use your peak output as close to the impact zone as possible, as close to impact with the ball as possible. So let's, let's talk about our athlete in particular. So we have an athlete, and let's just talk about our first component. Let's talk about power production, okay? So we know that the athlete is in our normal ranges of the elite level uh, you know, population, but on the low side. And we know that recruitment is certainly an issue, although 
uh, function and, and correlation is, is a little bit more an issue. Recruitment is also an issue. But we want to know better what what does that mean? Where does where does the where is recruitment or a failure to recruit coming from? And and in what body segments and in what shape does this take place? So we can very quickly assess that by looking first at the kinetic link. So what jumps out right away in this athlete's um, movement parameter is, is the lower body peak output and timing relative to uh, the overall kinetic length. So in a nutshell, what we can do is say we have an athlete uh, from a power perspective that uh, if you look at, say, maximum hip speed at 389, let's even round up to 400, is about 300 degrees per second, a little bit more than 300 degrees per second, off of our normal, off of our um, our, our average, you know, elite population for that. So from a kinetic length perspective. So we know right away lower body is our issue with respect to power. We don't have to look any further. So we've got two issues. We've got maximum output, which is maximum speed attained, and we also have the, the speed with which or the impulse with which that, that speed is being produced. So we've got two issues with respect to, to power, and that's lower body speed, you know, in, in terms of top end speed, and the quickness or the, the rate at which that speed is being created. So right away we know in terms of our power leak, it's lower body, and it's uh, both speed in terms of, you know, recruitment, as well as quickness in terms of impulse, or the rate of force development, the rate of speed development. So that tells us right away where we need to focus. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can then manifest this in terms of the training program. But very simply, we can look at our initial layer data to give us a lay of the land. And then we look at our second level data, our more advanced level data, very specifically, very quickly, ascertain what our power issues are. All right? So we've got essentially uh, a power issue that's related to lower body, that's related to recruitment or the ability to create speed, and then also uh, impulse or the, the rate at which speed is being created. Pretty simple. All right, let's let's talk about then our second parameter or second issue, which is actually the more um, uh, important issue to some degree. We're biased towards the coordination, so we want to look at where is our coordination um, problematic, or where is our our ability to sort of link this kinetic link or kinetic chain process. Where is it faltering? Where is it uh, where is, is it most specifically faltering in this equation. So we know that to some degree lower body is an issue because of the impulse issue and because of the output issue, the timing relative, you know, the overall coordination is not real effective. But let's put that aside because we know that's more a power production uh, issue. Let's look rather to, to the next level of movement, uh, torso and arms. So what we see here is what you would normally look for in an, in, in an efficient movement pattern would be the torso, which is that upper thoracic, upper torso component, driving the arms, which would then drive the release of the bat or acceleration of the bat into the impact zone. Okay? And what we have is we have the torso, upper thoracic or upper torso, essentially locked together with the arms, peaking simultaneously. So that coordination effort results in an early release of the bat. All right, so you get peak out early, and then you get quite a bit of deceleration through the impact zone. So that's your percent utilization. So again, there's no black and white. So it's definitely a blend, and there's, there's mostly grays in the equation. But if we were to simply define what we've got going on, we see that we have um, uh, a power issue that's related to lower body specifically, and we have a coordination issue that's related to uh, torso extremities specifically. So because primarily because of the relationship between the upper torso and the arms, you get an early release of the bat. So you've got peak output of, of your bat speed, in particular your rotational component, occurring well before collision with the ball with quite a bit of deceleration through the impact zone. So we can pretty quickly say we've got a lower body power issue, we've got an upper body coordination issue. And we can get right to the point very quickly, and we can even start to sort of define what those issues are um, uh, uh, right off of this graph. We can define lower body as a max recruitment or force production issue as well as an impulse issue or timing or you know, a weight issue. 
and then you can define the upper extremity issue as the arms essentially outpacing the torso. And so you've got you know a, a, a breakdown there where the arms take over, it becomes a little bit more of an arm swing, and that affects timing overall. So you can get pretty specific. We'll take a quick look at some of the other areas real quick, uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of finish up here in the last 10 or so minutes talking about how this can be related then now we talked about evaluation, but how can this be related to uh, training or, or how, does, how, how you might want to approach training? Uh, we'll just take a quick break because we do have a question. Um, so the question is, how much does an early release of the bat increase um, or impact uh, your lower body speed issues. So it's sort of like your chicken or egg kind of, of question. And to be totally honest with you, it, it, there is, you can't just define one versus the other because they both affect each other. Extremity and, and certainly implement are going to affect um, the base. So in other words, the distal affects the proximal, the proximal affects the distal. There's no doubt about that. But um, in this scenario and in most scenarios, the proximal has, even in that gray kind of scenario, the proximal has more impact on the distal than the distal has on the proximal. And, and mostly because the, the, the coordination of, the, of this effort in the swing pattern, regardless of the type of swing for that matter, but um, the, uh, the swing pattern is going to be driven off of initially the lower body's ability to create force and drive. So if you've got a faulty pattern there, um, and, and issues with respect to that, then you're going to have ripple effect down the chain. Um, so just as a follow-up to the question, another another quick question here. I just I read, I read the question. Given that it seems easier to train coordination than speed, uh, moving XX guy. So this is more a, sort of a part of that initial evaluation. So, you know, given, given it seems easier to train coordination um, and then speed, uh, and again, I want to talk a little bit about that assumption, though, okay? Uh, but let's just go to the question. If it's easier to create coordination and speed, moving the XX guy up to 10%, uh, uh, up 10 to 100% utilization would appear more likely than raising the recruitment of the YY guy. And that's, that's true. I mean, I, I, you know, honestly, again, this isn't a black, there are black and whites, okay? So uh, for sure, I mean, there's, there's the grades, but then there's, there's biases along that. So I just want to make sure first that I answer the first question that, that the, I think the distal affects the proximal and vice versa. The proximal has more weight over the distal, especially in terms of the drive of the mechanism. Now, how you actually approach the training mechanism can be distal oriented, right? But you're really, even if you're using a distal oriented method, I personally think that you're really driving the, the proximal side of the equation as the driving force behind that. So, so, and again, that's that's the stuff that we're going to talk about as we move forward. Um, but that's that's a really good question, and it is it's definitely a big part of getting results as you move into application. So understanding, um, and it becomes subjective, and it becomes art form to some degree more than science. I mean, science is what drives this process for sure, but being able to use the science effectively is definitely an art form. And that's true of not just sports performance, coaching, training, that kind of stuff, but it's true of other, many other uh, disciplines, including just healthcare and medicine. You know, doctors are certainly, as an example, using the science to drive what they do as practitioners, but certainly as practitioners, it is much more an art form uh, than it is essentially a black and white science. And that's why there's so many, you know, out of all the doctors out there, there's certainly better doctors. And it's the same thing with coaches and trainers. There's a lot of coaches and trainers, but there's some guys who get significantly better results. And it's not necessarily their understanding of the mechanism that's better, but it's their ability to use their understanding of the mechanism to drive the change, to drive the results. Um, to, to uh, apply that information in such a form that you get uh, uh, performance enhancements. So that's, that's, a, that's a, a really good question, and, and that, that's a one that we're definitely going to dive into as we move forward. And we'll even dive into a little bit more tonight in the last part of this. As far as the question <coughs> uh, relative to coordination um, and uh, 
uh, recruitment. Again, it's not a black and white, and it, a lot of it depends on where it's coming from and the mechanisms that are driving it. So remember, and again, this is this is an important part of this process because it's not a black and white. It's not, and I think you know when you look at recruitment in, in, from a strength and conditioning perspective, it, you know it's it's viewed fairly simply as a muscular force uh, issue. You know, uh, recruitment creating force in the muscular fiber, you know, from a neuromechanical perspective, then from a, a, a soft tissue perspective or mechanics, soft tissue mechanics perspective, creating force. And then creating force in a pattern, or not just in a pattern, but in a way such that you, you do it quickly. And that's definitely part of it. But a big part of it, specific to the activity, is coordination. So even though we're talking about recruitment in this athlete, there's certainly a, a, a pattern a basis for the issue. It's not just a force production issue, right? And in fact, this athlete could have, uh, from a muscular output perspective, if you just look at individual muscle groups or individual muscles and force output, could have certainly um, uh, uh, good fiber development, good force production development, but is not utilizing that in, in this scenario real effectively. So even in our power recruitment a, a parameter, there is a hint of, of coordination in there, right? So, you know, just as, you know, and again, that's the, sort of the gray areas of this, but um, generally speaking, though, I would agree that that um, recruitment, to some degree, is a little bit harder to develop than the coordination of the effort. Um, uh, you know, both are difficult. I mean, changing someone's movement pattern is, de are, are, is, is a definitely a diff difficult process, and it definitely takes um, a concerted effort. Uh, but typically, you can change movement or coordination a little bit easier than you can take somebody, especially as they have to develop. Now, if they're young, and you've got them before they're 12, 13, 14, then, you know, if you've got your 6, 7, 8 to, say, 12, 13, you still have the ability uh, to to um, uh, help that individual create force, essentially, or recruit in a power perspective pretty easily. As they start to mature a little bit, uh, and they, if they haven't done some of that work, they certainly can lose the ability to, to, to uh, more effectively create the force component, and then they're certainly going to be relying on, on the coordination part. So, but overall, yeah, if you have someone who's creating a massive amount of power but doesn't coordinate it very well, you're probably better off with that athlete and trying to coordinate that effort a little bit better than you are trying to add speed to an athlete that has pretty good coordination but really poor output or, or say recruitment. Um, but again, there's, there's a lot of intangibles that you can dig down into uh, to get a better read. But as a generalization, I think that's probably, at least from my personal experience, that's probably true. Um, just real quick, if we look at, at, at mechanics here, one of the things that you'll see uh, from a mechanics perspective is that you have um, uh, some lower body issues as far as mechanics and stability and some torso. So you basically have a stride length that is uh, a little bit um, a little bit more open and a little bit shorter than what we would typically expect. And that's going to impact your ability to use the lower body. So that's where you've got to dig a little bit deeper here too. You know, and you've got to look and say, okay, this person has a recruitment issue, but um, certainly force production is a part of that, but definitely coordination has a, has a role. So in this case, there is some just stride mechanics issues right away that will have impact on, on force production right away or utilization. Um, and then there's things that we can do from a training perspective. That uh, lower body mechanic is impacting our, our core coordination, which then impacts our torso to arm uh, uh, coordination that we, we sort of deemed as the primary component of the breakdown in, in functional output or, or percent utilization. So they kind of blend together. They have, they're, inter, they're interacting with each other and they have relationships. So we want to take all this into consideration, you know, as we evaluate the athlete, sort of place them in a position of what do we want to do. So from a recruitment perspective, it gives you a good idea of where an athlete is now, of course, there's a lot of intangibles that, that aren't measured in swing performance that have to do with just, you know, uh, you know at, at plate pr presence and, and 
you know, uh, baseball knowledge and game awareness and all those kinds of things, attitude. I mean, there's, there's many, you know, an infinite number of things to some degree that have to be assessed. But from a movement perspective, what we're talking about, we get a pretty good lay of the land in terms of recruitment or a, a, a sort of a scouting perspective or where, where uh, this athlete lies. From a coaching and training perspective, we not only know where this athlete lies relative to where we may want them to be or where they want to be, we're trying to get them to be, you know, as far as being recruited or scouted. Um, we have a really good idea of what we need to do to start to have significant impact on performance. So let's let's finish up uh, with that part of this. If we just go back here um, to the slide presentation. So from an approach to training perspective, what we want to do with this athlete is we want to work, and again, you, you want a complete program, but we want to bias or skew components of that program towards the specific needs of the athlete. And they're going, to, they're going to change as you see the differences in these parameters. So this is just gives you an idea of where we want to be. So with this athlete, inside the context of your overall approach to training, your overall approach to swing technique, you want to work on lower body impulse primarily. So, so really what that boils down to is the athlete's ability to create force, hence speed at the lower body quickly. Not just the amount of speed, but how quickly that speed is being created. So from a strength and conditioning perspective, what that tells us is that we want to employ exercises in the strength and conditioning arena that uh, uh, focus on uh, um, limited or restricted ranges of emotion and heightened speed output, right? So, so let's, let's use an example of what I mean there. So we say like, if you say, for example, using Olympic lifts to create uh, speed, and it could be maybe barbell lifts, it could be uh, variations of kettlebells, whatever it is. Let's just let's use something like um, like a snatch movement, okay? Just as one one example, and there's non Olympic lift movements that we can talk about, but let's just use that as an example. If you're using a snatch movement as a, a for uh, as a force production, speed production um, part of your training, in this particular case in addition to what you might be doing with, say, your, your full range of motion, so your, your, your you know, barbell off the floor, traditional Olympic lift kind of snatch, you would also want variations that limit the range of motion and, and emphasize speed. So, so simply, in this case, this is simple, but a simple way to sort of define that is rather than an off the floor full movement, do a hanging variation, okay? So a hang variation, or it could be a box variation. I mean, there's a million different ways you can go about doing this. But if, if I say hang variation, you get the idea. Of what you're doing now from, an hang, from a hang orientation as opposed to off the floor is, if you think about it, the ability now to snatch the weight from a hang position is, is the range of motion is considerably limited relative to full off the floor. And the timing with which that athlete has to create lower body force and pelvic control to, to initiate the movement of the snatch is greatly reduced. So you have, you have a limited range of motion in an activity that is, is emphasizing impulse or the rate of speed or race, rate of force development. So, so again, you just, and that's from a more strength condition perspective, there's a million variations of this. But we know with this athlete that those kind of variations are going to be extremely important when we are, are emphasizing the parts of the strength condition component uh, that are going to improve power or recruitment for this person. Um, from a technique perspective or emotion perspective, hitting mechanics perspective, let's say, we want hitting drills or hitting movements that are, again, very similar in that they restrict the range of motion isolate the lower body, and they require uh, short response, you know, impulse or short response for force production. In other words, we want to emphasize rate of force production or impulse in those movements. So there are um, um, variations of, 
of, of soft toss types of, of, of drills. There are variations of even, uh, say for example, um, short screen stuff or variations of T work that would limit the lower body overall range of motion and, and emphasize uh, uh, impulse or force production or, or quickness, if you will. So, I mean, a very simple way to look at this is if you're doing, uh, say, a short toss variation or, or, or I mean, soft toss variation or, or you know, a, a batting tee variation or something like that, would be rather than allowing the athlete to stride in, that, in, in whatever the variation of, of say, the drill that you're running through, is to put the athlete in the stride position and in the mechanism heighten their ability to have to, you know, so in other words, a rapid fire, soft toss type of scenario or something like that with them in a stride position where you've now limited the time and you've limited the range of motion and you're emphasizing what they need in terms of lower body uh, force and uh, impulse. And then lastly, from a what we refer to as PST or progressive skills training, sort of the blending between the technique stuff and the, the strength conditioning stuff, you would want to do um, very specific, uh, very isolated movement training that again embodies that, that principle of limiting the range of motion but and height at the same time and as a function of limiting that range of motion, heightening the time with which the athlete needs to produce that speed. Um, and, and there's a lot of variations that we can use in terms of with, with respect to lower body, um, whether it be implement based or med ball based or, or um, uh, you know, using different variations like ropes or, or um, uh, you know, towel snaps and stuff like that. But where we're doing that from a um, uh, limited range of motion perspective. And so we've isolated the lower body. We are at the same time isolating the lower body, enhancing the um, rate of force development uh, or, or, you know, emphasizing that and creating lower body power. So then with respect to torso and arm coordination, so from a strength and conditioning perspective here, what we want to do is exercises that are both dynamic and power based as well as your, your uh, you can do cable work, band work, you know, all kinds of different variations. But what you want to emphasize here is the, the uh, act of anchoring with the upper thoracic and, and moving the um, extremities as a function of that anchor. So, so a simple movement like, say, for example, a chop lift pattern would be a good variation here. But what you want to do is, in a chop lift pattern, for example, is you want to emphasize the torso uh, being stable while the arms accelerate away from the torso using the, the torso as an anchor to create distal end acceleration. So what's missing in this equation is the dynamics between uh, the acceleration of the torso and the deceleration of the torso or the, the movement and the stability. So you, you in the kinetic link or in this process, you have um, a sequence of acceleration deceleration at the more proximal or mobility stability at the more proximal segment. That stability after the mobility or the deceleration after the acceleration is what facilitates in the most efficient way the proximal movement. So you want to go distal proximal in this excel decel mobility stability type of pattern and you want to work your way up from the ground up out to the extremity and the implement. So you basically um, in your in your strength conditioning um, uh, exercises you want to pick exercises like chops, um, med ball tosses or throws, um, to be totally honest with you, this could even be, even though it's not diagonal in nature, this could be, uh, say, a bench press movement where, or, or some sort of flat press movement where you are stabilizing the core as the anchor and moving the extremity. And there's a million, and when we get into this stuff down the road, I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of variations of all this stuff and show you all the different things you can do, and then you can just kind of take off from there and go. But you could say, like, for example, if you want it to be more rotary, you can do dumbbell presses. Just as one example, um, while emphasizing core brace and core stability, uh, torso stability, core, you know, torso brace, right, and, and, and extremity movement, and you can, if you, if you work it, uh, say, single arm dumbbell pressing or kettlebell pressing, 
and there's all these kind of variations. Now you're working the rotational component, even though the movement is somewhat planar, you're actually emphasizing rotational. In other words, as we get more dynamic, we can actually be rotational in the movement. The, uh, so, and then in, with respect to, to coaching uh, and, and even the movement, uh, uh, sort of the PST-based stuff, that's again where you want to um, be focused on anchoring the torso and moving the extremities. Uh, anchoring the torso, moving the extremities, moving, uh, moving the, um, the implement itself. So in this case, we want to emphasize uh, activities where the arm dynamic uh, works off of the core. We get some separation, if you will, between the arms and the torso. There's a distinct uh, uh, sort of differentiation between the movement. And this can be done in both our technique activities as well as our movement parameter activities. We use things like um, uh, sort of modified chops with an implement. We use things like um, uh, upper body differentiation exercises, left arm, right arm, things like that. And then those can all be related to uh, coaching. And I, again, when we get into these in, in the upcoming weeks, I'll actually show you. Um, and then the bat, bat release dynamic is just a sort of an, uh, an extension of number two, where now we're talking about being able to create that coordination, torso arm out, and then be able to brace or stabilize the body, especially at the core, um, but certainly the lower body as well, so that we can force the implement to release, gain speed efficiently off of the body, off of the arms, and into the impact zone. So we want to get the majority of the output occurring through the impact zone, which we're not seeing right now. So again, from a uh, um, uh, certainly an exercise dynamic, there are uh, race-related exercises that again can be um, you know, med ball based, that can be uh, Olympic lift based, kettlebell based, those kinds of things. And then we have, you know, for example, a very simple one would be essentially uh, 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 kettlebell swings are a good example. One arm kettlebell swings even better, where you're, you're, you're focused on, you know, all those different components, in particular the extremity implement, you know, arms, kettlebell coordination. From a coaching teaching perspective, we work on stabilizing, uh, releasing, we can do towel snaps, we can do uh, variations of uh, bat-related uh, sort of long or short response um, plyometrics. And so there's a lot of things that we can do with respect to the uh, bat release dynamic across the board as well. And these would be then specific to what we see as a function of um, this individual athlete's needs. So again, from a, for just to backtrack, and we'll just kind of finish up here, and then certainly I'll entertain any questions, any additional questions. But what we're really talking about is the ability to tonight is, is the ability to evaluate a player's performance in a few key areas with some simple numbers that can then be translated into a more involved evaluation. That more involved evaluation uh, main focus is to not just evaluate the player, but to derive a, a, a practical, clinical application for training and coaching that will have the most significant impact. So you've got the ability to evaluate, and that can be as simple as scouting and recruiting, but certainly from a coach-trainer perspective, evaluating your athlete for player development. So that's the crux of tonight, but you can see that as you start to move into your um, uh, your functional training, your strength conditioning, and your coaching, that, that what we find in terms of evaluation has direct impact on how you want to approach the development of that athlete for maximum output, maximum gains. So as we move forward in this series, the next three weeks, we're going to talk about in more depth very specific areas of this, of this equation, lower body, core, extremity, implement. And as we talk about them, we'll not just talk about the science of them and the measurement of them in more detail, but we'll talk about the anatomy and the function and the neuromechanics of each of the components. And ultimately, though, what we want to talk about as a derivative of the first two is what do we do about it? And I'm going to take the time, and, and tonight uh, there's no need for video conference, but moving forward, we'll be using the facility that we're partnering with, that's a full gym facility that includes all strength conditions as well as all the functional stuff. And the second half of this equation is going to be to outline training programs and to demonstrate those exercises and discuss why they're important and how they have impact so that you have something 
uh, to move forward with uh, in, in terms of a knowledge base and, and your training and your coaching and your evaluation. So moving forward, we're going to get very specific in some very key areas and with very, very specific examples. Uh, and so it won't just be essentially you know, lecture, it will be hands-on uh, and, and we'll use the video conferencing to actually demonstrate the exercises and talk about the exercises. So uh, I'll leave the, 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 um, sort of the mic open here for a few more minutes. Um, we're just a few minutes over our, our time. So if there are any specific questions about the evaluation process, throw them out there. Otherwise, uh, a couple minutes will end, end tonight. Um, this will be uh, posted as soon as I can get it uh, online. So you can download it and have it as a reference. And then moving forward, we'll have more specific, more in-depth uh, evaluation of key areas with, most importantly, um, very specific ideas of what you can do from a training and a movement perspective with, with the actual exercises outlined and demonstrated using the uh, um, video conference. So uh, I don't see any additional questions. I'll give everyone a few minutes in case you're typing them. Um, but if there aren't you know, any additional questions here in the next minute or so, I'll, I'll end the, the, uh, the session for tonight and then uh, look forward to, to connecting up with everybody next week. Um, and I'll you know, put it out on Facebook and, and uh, some social media as well as emails or some of you guys uh, where you can find the recorded version of uh, this evening. So I don't really, I don't really see any uh, uh, questions per se. Um, so I think we'll just wrap it up for tonight. If you do have questions and you get a chance to, to forward them on to me, just email me or uh, you can message me or, or, or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, I can just answer them individually. And, and if they're good questions, I'll post them on the baseball forum. If you're not a part of the baseball forum, definitely jump in there because for up until now, we've been using the baseball forum on Facebook mostly just for general, general stuff, general discussion, mostly just posting of information. But, um, but uh, uh, going forward, I'll be posting uh, webinar-specific stuff in the forum. So if you're not a member, Join it. If you don't know where it is or what I'm talking about, just hit me up with an email or, or a message and I'll get to it. There is, there is, um, uh, there is a there is a question real quick here that I'll, I'll answer real, real fast. Um, th there's a question about what the difference is between lag in a baseball swing and lag in a golf swing. And to be totally honest with you, there is no real difference between the two. There are certainly, you know, the characteristics are different um, because of the plane of movement, the, the weight of the object, you know, the, the timing of the, of the, I mean, baseball, the baseball sequence occurs uh, much more quickly than a golf uh, sequence because of the, 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 um, the need to create, you know, to, 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 to time the activity with, say, a 90 mile an hour or 100 mile an hour fastball. Um, so there's, there's definitely characteristic differences, you know, in terms of the sort of the semantics of the movement. But in terms of what lag is and why it's important, there's really no difference. And it's not just the difference between baseball and golf, but it's really, there's no difference between essentially extremity implement lag in any activity. And that includes stuff like tennis serves, that includes, uh, you know, um, uh, think, think of any other uh, implement activity you can think of, including stuff like, uh, you know, say polo or like horse polo um, or, or any activity that either one or two arms is moving and implement. So there's really no difference in that what you're doing with respect to, to sort of lag is you are, uh, the lag is a function of the sequence occurring from the ground up. So as the sequence occurs in, in, in order from the ground up, lag is just a natural function of the, the, the more proximal segment of the extremity, whether it's two arms or one arm, let's say. Um, leading the, the, so that more proximal segment, leading the more distal segment, which is the implement, whatever the implement is. And so lag is created as a function of sequence. And, and so that, but what's important about lag is that what the lag is doing is creating an environment where for two, two, and we're going to get into this more in, in like essentially three weeks when we talk about extremities and, and implement. But basically, there's two, two advantages to creating lag. One is you're reducing the, the moment of inertia for accelerating the implement until right at the point of release. 
and, and I can explain what that means and show you, you know, as we move forward. But you're essentially reducing that, that moment of inertia or that resistance to moving the infinite. Right? So if you think of a, a, a golf club or a baseball bat, if you were to hold the, the, the baseball bat or the golf club straight out away from the arm and try to swing it that way the entire time, the, the club itself added to the arms with the rotational movement essentially focuses uh, around an axis of, of the, the sort of the center of the torso or you can think of it maybe as your spine. The, the moment arm is significantly longer and um, uh, the resistance to the movement is going to be considerable. So the one thing is the, the resistance to the movement and the second thing that's created out of lag is the ability then to uh, utilize the, um, the, the act of the movement um, to uh, uh, release the implement uh, with greater speed by pushing the axis of rotation uh, or the axis of gyration from the center of the torso initially to an axis that revolves around the wrist and the hand as opposed to the center of the torso, we're reducing the axis of gyration. Right? And again, I'll get into that as we, as we move forward. The continuation of the question real quick is um, that you've got you know, two guys who swing differently, um, one opening lag. So, so real quick, yeah, okay. So, so the one opening's lag, one opens lag sooner, which creates a wider arc, and then one has uh, sort of a tighter arc. So, the, the question basically boils down: Is a wider arc better, uh, uh, or is a wider arc uh, better than more lag? So, <laughs> it's a little bit of a difficult question to answer at this point because we haven't gotten into the in-depth discussion of that part of this mover, which is going to be in three weeks. But the short answer to that is it's less about what you see as the arc, okay, and what is occurring with respect to the dynamics and the relationship between the body, the arm, or I mean, sorry, the arms and the implement itself. Okay. So for example, Look at look at uh, uh, look at your uh, you know, look at golf as an example. Take somebody who creates a massive amount of lag, you know, uh, and then flings the club at the last minute, and, and it's really obvious relative to somebody who doesn't. And you can just pick your favorite golfers. A perfect example of a wide arc that looks like they don't have a lot of lag or relationship between the arms and, and the uh, the club, but actually have a very significant relationship is a guy like Greg Norman from way back in the day. We've got a ton of, so for example, data on Greg as a golfer, has a very wide arc, a very wide movement, almost looks like the early releases, almost looks like he casts the club to some degree if you go back and look at his old films. But uh, having data on him, we know that even though his, his arc looks wide, looks like it has less lag, so to speak, he actually develops over 2,000 degrees per second of lag speed, right? So it's it's not necessarily the look of the lag, but it's more the dynamic between the body segments or the body segment and the implement. So that's, I mean, again, we're going to get into that more. Now, a wider arc relative to a more lag-based kind of swing has certainly has uh, swing implications. You know, in other words, in golf or in baseball, the, the, the delivery of the implement into the impact zone is going to have implication. And we're going to talk about the variations of stuff. Even at lower body, you're going to have discussion and you're going to have a, a dynamic there about guys who say it should be more rotational, it should be more linear, right? But what's important there is not necessarily whether it's more rotational or more linear, but if the dynamic between the movement of the center of mass and the center of pressure, let's say, as an example, um, or the ability to create force and the movement of the center of mass of the body is, is appropriate, right? And so you're going to have approaches. Linear characteristics, if you bias it, if you're doing that appropriately and you bias it towards a linear characteristic, and again, I'll explain this more uh, next week, but if you bias it towards linear characteristic, you're still utilizing the same principle, but you have uh, certain advantages and disadvantages with respect to the baseball swing or with respect to hurt hitting certain types of pitches or, you know, you know, moving the ball on the field, certain types of relative to, say, rotational dynamics. So as far as the biomechanics of the drivers, whether you're a wider arc-looking person or a 
more lag-based person, or whether you're a linear type style hitter or more rotational style hitter, it doesn't as matter doesn't matter as much as the implementation of the biomechanics. So uh, another follow-up question. Um, Why are some of the best hitters not letting the bat pass the hand after release, after releasing the bat into the ball? Um, not exactly sure what that means. Uh, can you just quickly explain what you mean the bat passing? You're talking about the head of the bat, you're talking about rotational, or you're talking about more anterior posterior, you know, like left, right. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by the bat passing the hands. And I think again. That's, that's another thing that when we get into this data part, we aren't going to use terms like bat passing the hand. Nothing is anything wrong with that, but that's a fairly vague explanation. And I don't know if you can be real quantitative about actually defining that. Um, we will have quanti quantitative definitions of what release means and, and how the bats release uh, body segment to implement, um, that kind of stuff. But maybe real quick. Um, and I can try to answer if you can you just describe to me what you mean by the bat passing the hands. Because, I mean, you know, if you're looking at it face on visually, uh, maybe it looks like the end of the bat stays uh, behind the, the mechanism, the hat hands a little bit longer, but ultimately there's no way for the bat not to rotate past the arm segment. Um, It'd be near impossible, you know. You'd say in golf as an example, you talked about golf. In golf, there are golfers who can delay the lag a little bit. You know, they're referred to as tail draggers or whatever. But you know, you can't stop the club from from fulfilling its movement pattern, um, and that movement pattern is going to include the club releasing essentially past the extremities. So that's that's kind of a given. Um, you can delay it a little bit. But in delaying it, you got to look at it from a 3D perspective. Are you delaying it uh, by creating more rotational movement? That could be. Um, I'm not sure. But we can get into this more as we as we uh, you know as we get into the actual details of the, of the movement. I think it's um, and I'll just finish up with this is, is this, I think it's dangerous to try to, to base too much of this stuff on 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 really subjective measures and and on sort of visual assessments of a movement. Um, you know, what we're going to get into in the next three weeks are, are the, the 3D anatomical based quantitative measurements um, which are, are definable. Now in that you can say here's an athlete that um, looks a certain way to me um, and here's an athlete who looks a different way to me and then we can say more quantitatively what those differences might actually be if there is a quantitative anatomically based difference between the two um, and then and then you have more of a objective quantitative definition as opposed to a more vague subjective kind of visual based uh, uh, description of what you're trying to to, um, to uh, uh, describe you know and, and also that's the other thing too is is as we move forward on this, and that's the whole point of this measurement thing is um, looks are deceiving, um, and certainly a lot of the measurements that are out there are, are limited at, at best, and so you're getting, um, you know, you're getting vague information, and, and, and a lot of times that vague information isn't necessarily um, related to what is, is actually happening in an anatomical you know, uh, swing coordination uh, output basis. So, you know, that that's also what we want to try to talk about. And part of this is also trying to do, do a better job of quantitatively, more objectively, and more realistically, and I mean realistically from the function of anatomy and biomechanics, defining the parameters and defining the differences between swing styles if there are. Because a lot of times the visual, the visuals between swing styles are very superficial um, and and, and, and don't have significant impact, um, you know, many times even with the visual being completely different uh, between, between hitters, the, the functional output is very similar. So anyway, we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll, uh, we'll wrap up uh, from here.
and uh, get this posted. And then next week we'll get into the more specifics here, and we'll um, uh, uh, you know start talking about lower body. Okay. I appreciate everyone uh, joining tonight, and uh, hopefully it was informational and beneficial. And if you have additional questions, just message me or email me or, or bring them up next week, and we can talk more about it.